And all during this time, my husband who had supported me, he had four cancers. The major was his left side of his face. They took the parotid glands, the lymph nodes, and a lot of other things, and he had uh, just about the left side of his face removed, and they grafted skin off his right leg. Then we did 34 radiation and chemo treatments. So in between my trips to Washington to testify, twice before the House, twice before the Senate, and then I would go back for the National Women's Law Center would pay me, pay my plane ticket and my lodging, and I would go back and spend three to four days in Washington, and a day, typical day for me when I was there would be, I'd get up at four and be on the call-in radio programs from five to seven. I'm get dressed, and I might do an NPR radio program or some interviews or a magazine interview, and then I'd go up to the Hill, first in the Congressional, the House offices, and then to the Senate to talk to people to try to gain support. We didn't uh, have to talk to Democrats because they supported it. But we did have to visit a lot of Republican offices, and we did have some Republicans who supported it. But there were a lot of opposition. And then when the president-elect's staff called and wanted me to speak at the Democratic Convention, I thought about it overnight. I called D.C. back the next morning, and I said, I'll be there. Just tell me where and when. That was one of the top highlights of my life. I went with the National Women's Law Center negotiating that I would not endorse Obama. But I walked out on that stage at Tuesday evening during prime time, and the audience's faces that I could see down front and meet their eye contact, the women had tears running down their faces. The men was going, yes, yes. Well, John McCain had just said, what we women need is some more education and some more training. So I walked off the stage, the first reporter handed me a mic. When did you endorse Obama? I said, right now. <laughs> I, said, I said, I'm endorsing him right now. I turned around. <laughs> made my first commercial. <laughs> the little girl with the camera back there at work for the campaign, she said, let's do a commercial. I said, you're ready. And I was. I was so fired up. And wearing the red suit, I can tell you, that was a good key. I, I went back to the hotel that evening. I got a lot of hugs. <laughs> but along the way, then I got to campaign for the president-elect, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but we did gain a lot of Republicans because you see equal pay and equal rights and civil rights, it's not Democrat or Republican. It belongs to everyone here. And I can assure you, and I don't know a lot of you and haven't even met you, but I can guarantee you this touches your family, some member, somewhere along the way, either now or later. And there's nothing in the law that will allow an individual, like in my case, if the Supreme Court had ruled in my favor, there's nothing in the law today that allows an individual to go back and get adjustment for all those lost retirements. My Goodyear retirement, my contributory retirement, my Social Security, or my 401k. That's the shame of it. Then in December of last year, I went to New York to do the 2020 segment with Elizabeth Vargas. She was actually doing it, the segment on why employers keep the payroll and the pay scales such a big secret. But in the middle of the interview, I said something to the effect about my retirements and how many I'd lost and how much. And she said, oh my gosh, and hit her forehead and from that point on, she kept talking about the pay and equal pay and what it does to a family. But when I got home the next, that afternoon, I found my husband dead. He had died with a massive stroke. The cancers he had and the treatment wore his body down and he couldn't survive. But I became another statistic. 
My income dropped in my household that day 50%, and my utilities went up. The next bill I got, they were increased. So we women normally outlive our spouses, and that causes another hardship in this country, where women cannot support themselves on what they're making. It's not right, because we've earned it. We're legally entitled to it. I didn't ask any employer that I work for to give me anything. Just treat me fair. Just treat me like the men. And the African Americans, I learned later, were paid less than I was, even the men. And I heard that when the, in fact, I was even told, uh, Kevin's in the back of the room, and I was on the train trip with him last year to Washington, one of uh, Senator Leahy's staff folks, been around a long time, appreciate Kevin. But one of those people on that trip, Kevin, had a message for me from a person in Akron, Ohio, thanks for the raise, Lily. So when my headlines, Jacksonville, Alabama woman awarded $3.8 million. You see those reporters love that. They didn't cut down to the 300,000 and the 60. But everybody in management positions, African American and women, got a thousand dollars a month raise. Some of them got promotions. Now you ask yourself, why are we so far behind? One of the women who testified for me at my trial, she had worked for Goodyear for 22 years, part of that time in the union, and then later was promoted to an area manager. She made below the minimum, but she finally got fed up, sold her service, and at that time she was a supervisor for Honda. But when she was working for Goodyear, the lawyer asked her, well, why did you never complain? She said, well, I was a divorced mother with a handicapped blind son who's 20, and I have to support him, and we lived paycheck to paycheck. I couldn't afford to bring it up because I knew that I would be unemployed. But when that door opened for Lily Ledbetter, and I lost in the Supreme Court, it not only hurt me and my family, it hurt each one of you. And I don't want that to happen to you because I know if you're like me, you get caught up in the daily life of struggles, of shopping for food and clothing and household chores and working and keeping your family on the straight and narrow and then doing the school and the sports and all the things that life involves. And you don't sometimes think about where you're headed and what your journey is. And I never would have believed that a corporation like Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company would have done us women and minorities like they have done. Because we were filling government contracts, the job they moved me from and to, to help force me out, I was having to inspect Hummer tires. Well, if you've ever seen a Humvee, you know how large the tires are, and they're quite heavy, you can only get 12 on a truck. But we were filling two government contracts at, the, at that time. I would have never believed, and I've learned since this case, that they're not required to. But a lot of the states I've traveled to are passing their own laws now to make it mandatory if a person has a contract, either government or, or something in their state, they will be required to adhere to all federal and state guidelines.